Rest is what happens when order has been established. And so God has brought about order and he rests, he ceases the ordering process, that's Shabbat. But mm -hmm. then he also rests by taking up his seat, not by laying in a bed, but by sitting yeah. on the throne. All I could see was this light coming in. The Holy Spirit went, it blew into me. I have never been the same since then. That was it. I'm done. I was born again. Welcome to the New Bird Christian Podcast. I am your host, Samuel Delgado, and this is episode 66. I interview John Walton about Genesis 1 through 3. We talk about his books, The Lost World of Genesis 1 and Adam and Eve, and how to read Genesis 1 through 3 from the ancient Near Eastern context. So, with no further ado, let's get weird. Welcome back. Uh, I'm excited. We've done two interviews on other books in your Lost World series, and but I feel like Genesis 1 um, is obviously the one that kind of started the entire series, and I've kind of been looking and reading a lot about Genesis, and I noticed uh, in almost every book that I'm reading about Genesis, they reference you. Um, and so I wanted to kind of start there and ask you about that because uh, this seems to have had a, a pretty big impact um, and influence on other scholars and their understanding of Genesis 1. So, um, you know, what's your response to the reception uh, to, to this first book, the, the Lost World of Genesis 1? Yeah, that's a great question, Samuel. It's and good to be with you again. Yeah. Uh, the It's really difficult to gauge reception. Now, you're right. I can track footnotes and things like that if I were so inclined to do so. Uh, but even that is just just a snapshot, just yeah. a partial picture. Um, when people ask me how my view is being received, well, it's a mixed bag. You know, it doesn't take a lot of hunting around on the, the blogosphere to, <laughs> to figure out that there's a lot of people that don't like what I'm saying. Yeah. Uh, that have very deep disagreements and unfortunately I think sometimes misrepresent me. Mm. Uh, but yet you're right, there are lots of books that are uh, echoing what I'm saying, developing what I'm saying, relying on what I'm saying, and that's always great. Um, I get emails from people that uh, indicate that you know they're really enjoying what I write. I get very few emails that um, that are complaining or arguing with me. But yeah. that doesn't mean those people aren't out there. So it's really a difficult thing to gauge. There's no sort of formal survey that's uh, statistical analysis. Sure, yeah. So it's, it's, in that sense, it's all anecdotal. It, it's all based on uh, who happens to write what. And uh, so I think that's, it's hard to gauge. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's a good point. Um, and I have seen, uh, you know, sort of people that, that disagree, but most of kind of the scholarship that I'm reading are, are kind of taking what you've written and, and, and really building upon it um, and using it to kind of bolster their their understanding as well. So, um, but it is it's no surprise that some people would, would take issue with it because it is so drastically different than I think how we've often interpreted Genesis 1. And, and read through it. Uh, so for those, I, I, I'm hoping that most people listening are somewhat familiar, because uh, I, I want to kind of ask questions that are uh, sort of an extension of, of your writing. Uh, but can you give us just uh, an idea of the, the basic premise of, of, your, of your, your first book, The Lost World of Genesis 1, and what the, the premise of that, that book is? Sure. There are two basic elements that come out of a central premise. The central premise is we should be reading Genesis as an ancient document. Scripture, yes, of course, but an ancient document. And therefore, if we take the Bible seriously, that its authors have a message and that message communicated in their world and God gave it to them in their context, then we should be reading it in the context of the ancient world. That's the basic premise. It's, um, it assumes biblical authority. And it tries to recognize that the 
Bible speaks into its world. And that's why I say the Bible is written for us, but it's not written to us. The two basic elements that come out of that is first that Genesis 1 is not so much interested in telling the story of God creating the material universe. He did, of course, but that's not the story they want to tell. The story they want to tell is about God ordering the world. This was a big deal in the ancient world, and creation stories in the ancient Near East tend to tell that story. And the fact that Genesis 1 doesn't talk about manufacturing material objects for the most part, but does talk about how the world is ordered to function with God's purposes in mind, suggests to me that it's really a different kind of creation story than what we necessarily would craft in our world today. That's the first result. The second result is identifying what that focus and purpose is. And that's where the idea of a cosmic temple comes into play. That is that God is creating a place that will be our home, but also his home, hmm. where he intends to dwell among us in relationship with us. And so in that sense, it's the cosmos is being portrayed as sort of sacred space. Sacred space is sacred, not because of some external inherent quality, but because God is there. Hmm. The idea here that God wants to dwell among us, take up his rest among us, be with us, uh, is the basic purpose for the ordering that takes place. Um, and I eventually, not in that book, but eventually developed the um, contrast of building a house and making a home. Hmm. Both are creation stories. The building of a house with its foundation, its roof, its electricity, its plumbing, all of that is one kind of creation story. Making a home, that is what you do in that house, how you make it function for what you want to do and what you want your home to be, uh, that exudes purpose. Mm -hmm. And so that idea of, you know, what kind of creation account is this? Is it a house story or is it a home story? When we think about origins in our modern scientific world, we think of house stories. And what I am contending is that Genesis, as most other creation stories in the ancient world, is a home story. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that. Um, so there's there's really so much uh, of this view that really resonates, and I think that's why um, a lot of people tend to uh, agree. Um, they see how um, this theme of God dwelling with man is repeated uh, all throughout Scripture, and so it it's fitting to see this here in Genesis one. Um, now there are some things because I've always thought of this as the the house story mm -hmm. um, that there's some disequilibrium and it's you know it, it's it takes some adjusting to kind of think okay how do I think about this differently um, and so some of those questions I have are kind of built off of that um, hmm now one thing that I thought was really neat was the the seven day structure and comparing that to Solomon's temple and the, the seven days. Uh, that they took to dedicate that temple. And so that was one of those things that was like, oh my goodness, wow. Um, I see the connection. Um, and you have a lot to say about the seventh day. And before we get there, one question that came to mind, because I see um, with the, with, and it's always, there's always that confusion with light being created on day one and the sun being created on day four. So what this does is it, it shows function um but that's easier to see with things like light and and the the lights in the heavens whereas with creating the animals um that just when you read it it just seems like that seems more like house like i'm just i'm i'm making these uh these creatures um so what would be the function um for the creation of the animals uh, I would think of them more like furniture instead of like the plumbing. That is home instead of house. Uh, God is populating 
their world, his world. I mean, it's, yeah. it's both. And so to that extent, uh, he says, let, let them emerge, let them come forth from the ground, even that kind of idea uh, where it's not describing a physical process, but rather that, uh, that, that the animals would uh, be part of the, the home that God is setting up. And that's really important for people because as they subdue and rule, right, at the end of the passage in the sixth day, that involves the domestication of animals, the use of animals, the enjoyment of animals. Mm -hmm. And so that all comes into the, the purpose statement. Uh, really, in, on day six, with the animals, is the closest you get to a physical material creation issue. But even so, it deals with populations, hmm. whole populations uh, that uh, are brought into place. And so, again, uh, uh, you certainly can point to that and say that sounds material. But if nothing else in the text does, hmm. then why should we think that materiality is the issue? Right. Yeah. So that's what I thought you were going to say, because in studying this, one of, something that comes up is the the framework interpretation where we see parallels between uh, day one and four, two and five, three and six. And within those parallels, we do see we create the sky and then who populates the sky? The birds. And so that it, it seems to make sure. sense. Um, well, even it, in that even in that framework hypothesis, which I have no trouble with, that's an accurate description of the literary structure of the text. Uh, but even in that, uh, that begins to alert us to the fact that this is not necessarily a chronological sequence. Yeah. If you treat that structure as literary, then it's not necessarily chronological. And of course, I go the next step beyond that and say not only is that a literary issue, but once we see that we're dealing with kind of ordering the world and that we're prioritizing certain things over other things, uh, again, the the intention is not to present a chronological treatment. So both in terms of priority, functions, order, and in terms of literary structure, it turns us away from thinking chronological sequence. Yeah, and that's such a different way of thinking about it. Um, but it actually alleviates a lot of issues that you get when, when looking at it chronologically. I mentioned already the, 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 the sun and light. Um, but then, you know, a lot of people well, I'll get there next, but they, they look to Genesis 1 as an origin story. And so we have a lot of different ways to look at the origins of the earth, the age of the earth, based on Genesis 1. Um, and if certainly reading it chronologically, it, you kind of set yourself up to have a lot to explain. Uh, so I have some questions there. But before, I want to ask about day 7, because uh, you have a really... Um, uh, an awesome take, one I really, really like. Um, but so why don't you share that? And then I'll have, I do have a question on it. Well, one of the main points I make is that day seven is the climax. It's not a throwaway. Uh, mm. So many people talk about the six days of creation and day seven. Oh, that's something about some Jewish celebration of the Sabbath. Yeah. And, and it's, it's gone. You know, mm -hmm. it's a, it's um, a punctuation at, at, mm. at the end. And, I think instead that it's the main point. That is that God is ordering the world because he intends to take up his rest in it. Mm -hmm. Now, you don't get all of that detail, of course, in Genesis 1. You have to go to Exodus 20, where we have a different word for rest that's not just ceasing, mm -hmm. but God's taking up his residence and rest. And we have, of course, Psalm 134, uh, which, uh, I'm sorry, 132, which talks about God resting in the temple and that his rest in the temple is on a throne. Mm. So you have to put those pieces together. You don't get the whole shot in Genesis 1. But that idea that a rest is what happens when order has been established. And so God has brought about order and he rests, he ceases the ordering process. That's Shabbat. But mm. then he also rests by taking up his seat not by laying in a bed, but by sitting yeah, on the throne, right. which is really the big difference. That's that's the idea of day seven. God now is taking his throne, 
which is with people in the cosmos, mm. so to speak. Mm. And so that gives us an understanding of the purpose. All of this ordering is with a purpose. Wow. And that suggests, too, that the seven days, uh, since they are so intimately connected with temple dedication in the Bible and in the ancient world, that seven days is not about a physical, material time frame. It's imagining the building of the cosmos as similar to the building of a temple in both cases where God will rest. And the seven days then has importance for this issue of cosmic sacred space hmm. more than for something like the age of the earth. Yeah. Wow. I love that. Um, and yeah, I think too often we sort of get caught up and we read it just kind of with this scientific mindset and we're just kind of looking at for for those type of answers about origins uh, and we miss um, this message that, that you just laid out. I actually think you answered my question uh, talking about day seven because um, when you read it, it says that he rested from his work. So it seems like there is like the actual like sleep, like I'm like I'm tired, I'm going to sit down and, um, you know, like like we rest from from our work. Um, but of course the reference to later scriptures. Um, so it, it, is it, is there both this aspect of, I'm, I'm no longer attributing this function and now I'm taking on this rest. Um, so in that sense, there, there is like a, a rest from work. Is that how you interpret the rest from work? The idea of, of rest is that you have accomplished mm. the order bringing that you intended. Yeah. You know, when God gives Israel rest from their enemies, it's not naps. Yeah. It's not leisure time. Yeah. You know, it's rather he gives them stability, coherence, security, yeah. because things are in order. Rest is what you can do when order is characteristic. Mm. And okay. so uh, the, the idea God tells David, I've given you rest from your enemies on mm. every side. And yet Hebrews says, but the rest is not complete yet. That's because, of course, there's still more ordering to take place. Uh, Jesus says, you know, that come to me, all you who labor are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Yeah. That's rest that comes from the uh, kingdom perspective and the kingdom participation that he calls us to. Mm -hmm. So we have to understand this theology about rest that it's not, it's not about sleeping or leisure or downtime or yeah. relaxation. Yeah. Wow. That's so incredible. And, um, you know, when you look at rest elsewhere in Scripture, we don't, we, we don't read it in that way. But it's, it's so weird that somehow when we see it in Genesis 1, and I think part of this is the way we've learned it as children, we, we see the images of sleep. You know, most of the time when we're looking at children's books, um, story Bibles, they're they're just the, the, they're going the leisurely rest. Um, so it's just it, there's there's a disconnect, and I think once um, once you're able to to put those pieces, it 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 really just puts such a different take on creation. Um, and uh, boy, it, it's one that it fits with the rest of Scripture. So I uh, I love that. I want to ask you about the the creation mandate to to subdue and take dominion. Um, I've heard people that attribute this to those that are outside of the garden, extending sacred space. Now, some would say that this application is just for the rest of creation, the animals specifically. So what is your take on uh, subduing and taking dominion? Uh, like, how would that be properly carried out? Yeah. Um, in that book, I talked about extending sacred space, um, uh, and that was in largely agreement with Greg Beale's um, idea, Temple and the Mission of the Church. And uh, so we, I mean, he, he taught here at that time, and we had a lot of conversation about that. I think these days, I would be inclined to say, instead of extending sacred space, to the idea of extending order. Um, that's, that's in a sense extending sacred space because mm -hmm. God is the center and source of order. So there are some similarities, but I'm more inclined to think that order is the primary focus rather than 
mm. uh, the sacred space issue. Yeah. Um, you know, by the way, I, I keep using the word order, which is what I now prefer instead of the focus on function. When I wrote mm. uh, the Genesis 1, Lost World of Genesis 1, I was trying to figure out the way to express this idea, and yeah. function was the best thing I could come up with. Yeah. Uh, that God's making it to function in a certain way. But uh, even there, I used the idea that functioning had to do with having a role and a purpose in an ordered system. Right. So I was using yeah. the word order, but I've dra been drawn more and more toward that, that I think that's, in the end, a better descriptor, uh, that God is ordering the world. And that includes that things function according to their role and purpose. Uh, but Again, I think function is still an important word, but that order picks up more of what we're really getting at. Uh, yeah. Order is arguably, and in my view, it's uh, the highest value in the ancient world. And therefore, to describe God as ordering the world is the most important thing they could discuss. Hmm. And so that's, that's a transition that I've made in terms of my, my terminology. Uh, so in the book, I talked about a functional ontology, that something exists when it functions. And again, I would just shift that a little bit and say it exists when it's incorporated into the ordered world, yeah. know, which is connected to function. So it's not a change in my view. It's a change in my terminology. Yeah. So this is a, I don't know if there's anything you address in the book, but one one thing I see that comes up over and over again when I uh, study or, you know, read scholarship on, on Genesis is when it was written. And of course we see um, the ancient mindset and influence uh, in its authorship. Um, but some, some people attribute uh, the writing of the book much later uh, in the, during the exile. Um, and as some people say, well, of course it was, it was just, Put together um, during the exile that it was written, but then some maybe there was what's the word I'm looking for? Like like uh, like it was maybe parts of it were were written uh, a little bit later as well. So, do you have any uh, thoughts on that? Sure. I mean, I've, that's one of the Lost World books. Lost World of Scripture mm. uh, talks about the whole process of literary production in the ancient world. And it's something that we have very little understanding of today. Yeah. We talk about, you know, who's the author of this book when we talk about the Bible. You know, we start a Bible study. Who's the author of this book? Right. Well, that's a little easier when you're dealing with Romans uh, than it is when you're dealing with Old Testament. Right. Um, but the what we don't recognize is that um, the way we think about authors and books today has no comparison with the ancient world and how things worked. It was a hearing dominant world. Yeah. And that means that communication took place orally. Uh, there was no strong impulse toward writing. Writing had certain purposes and it was used in certain ways, but extremely limited. And that's not really a question about literacy. It's a question about sociology, how right. society and culture functioned. Uh, so as a result, if they had ideas to generate, they wouldn't say, oh, I'll sit down and write a book. Um, those ideas would be generated in different ways. Notice, of course, that the prophets spoke. Uh, their prophecies were eventually put into writing, probably not by them. Yeah. Gathered into the books that we know, probably not by them, but in a later time. But they were presented orally. And of course, notice Jesus didn't write any books. It was, yeah. you know, people wrote to collect what he had to say. So what we find is that much of what we have in the Old Testament would have developed in an oral context. Now, at some point, those oral ideas, let me call them traditions, that's not to, to demean them, okay? But at some point, those traditions would find their way into documents, maybe a scroll or a papyrus scrap or a clay tablet or something, but probably in pieces. Mm -hmm. you know, I could imagine that Abraham's stories would be told, 
And sooner or later, somebody would put th those stories into a document. But then those documents are, are recopied. The stories are retold over centuries. And eventually, somebody gathers all of those, whatever's in documents, fine, whatever's oral, fine. But somebody gathers it together and writes the book of Genesis. Yeah. We'd have no idea when that took place or who did it or what motivated them to do so. Um, but the thing is, we then, for, we then see the important difference between how old a tradition was and when it was written. Mm. Right. The two are not necessarily related at all. Sure, yeah. So we could imagine that these traditions come from very early periods. But when was the book of Genesis written is a totally different question. Right, yeah, yeah. Okay, so if it was compiled in the post-exilic period, okay, that doesn't mean that it's all a creation of the post-exilic period. Yeah, of course. Okay, so that's an important distinction. And again, I talk about that a lot in the Lost World of Scripture. Yeah, I might have to pick that up. Um, cool. Uh, I always end up reading more books after our interviews because um, it, it comes up. Now, you you talk a little bit about origins uh, in the book, and a, a lot of what I'm reading about Genesis deals with origins. And so a lot, of, uh, but of course, I don't, if I'm understanding correctly, um, with your interpretation, you could hold to your interpretation of Genesis 1 and still hold a, a young earth, a progressive, or a, a theistic evolutionary view. Is that correct? My point is that the Bible does not give us yeah. a scientific view. Yeah, yeah. So there's no biblical view of the age of the earth, no biblical view of scientific models, no biblical view of you know, those kinds of issues. You can talk yeah. about what the Hebrew word yom, day, means. That, that's fine. That's that's a text issue. Yeah. But I would say that um, whatever view you might have of the age of the earth or of whether evolutionary processes were used or not, you're not getting it from the Bible. Right. Yeah. And you may have reasons to think that one science or the other has more scientific value. That's fine. Uh, people have to make those decisions. So yeah. I'm not trying to promote a particular scientific view. I'm basically promoting an approach to interpretation that says the Bible doesn't give us a scientific view. Yeah, yeah. Um, now, despite that, a lot of people still, it's an important issue, right? Um, sure. The, the age of the earth. Uh, you know, have you, is that uh, a topic that you looked into? Do you have a stance on the age of the earth or evolution? Well, if you're just looking at the science, there's really no dispute. Even young earth people will say that the science tells you the earth is old. That's why they keep talking about right. appearance of age, right? Sure. Yeah. They wouldn't yeah. have to talk about appearance of age being created with appearance of age if the appearance didn't tell you otherwise. Yeah. So if you're talking only the science, there's really no dispute. The question yeah. is, does the Bible tell you something that's contrary to the science? Yeah. Again, in my approach, no, it doesn't. It's yeah, not absolutely. giving you science. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and, and, and it's difficult because if for, I think for a lot of people, they look at something like evolution and they see that the Bible clearly teaches something different. Um, and therefore, now they juxtapose these things, pitted them once to, uh, one against the other. Um, and you're saying they're not necessarily mutually exclusive. Um, I'm saying that, really... that they are compatible. If someone's inclined to an evolutionary model, uh, they don't have to be worried that the Bible cuts that off. Yeah. Um, certainly people who say there is no God cut that off, but that's not science. That's yeah. philosophy. That's metaphysics. Yeah. So the idea that um, if people are, are persuaded or suspect that an evolutionary model works best, the Bible's not going to tell them that isn't so. Uh, certainly the Bible doesn't describe an evolutionary process because it's not doing science. Yeah. When the Bible, the Bible's interested in agency, who did it and why. It's interested in purpose. And those are the things that I bring out. The Bible is not interested in mechanisms. How? Okay, what? What? 
the Bible's not interested in mechanisms. Science is interested in mechanisms. And But if the Bible's not offering mechanisms, except that God did it, well, God can do through any scientific process that he chooses. Yeah. And so the Bible's not interested in mechanisms, but in agency. Science is interested in mechanisms, and it can't address agency. Yeah. And in that in that way, they're really talking about different things, uh, both important things. But if that's the case, if the Bible's not addressing mechanism, then again, it can't be contradicting science, which only has an interest in mechanism. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I love that. I noticed that uh, theistic evolutionists, they, they, they champion uh, your view, this view of Genesis 1, uh, for reasons that you just said. I mean, you know, with this view, there's, 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 there's no conflict. And um, I think it gets muddied a little bit because, uh, as you mentioned also, a lot of atheists um, hold to the evolution view as well. And so I think for, for some people, um, that's why they kind of see evolution as something that's teaching that there is no God. Whereas, um, you know, when we look at Genesis, we can't really read the read it as like a science book or something like that. Um, well, so it's, it's refreshing to hear that. Certainly evolutionists attempt to commandeer evolution to their philosophy, their mm -hmm. metaphysics, their atheism. Mm -hmm. okay? yeah, sure. yeah, they are yeah, common, but they, it, is, it is an imperialistic act. They are commandeering it. Mm. You can't do that. Okay, Christians who believe that God is involved in creation at every step along the way can likewise work with an evolutionary model. Yeah. Uh, that doesn't reduce God's involvement. Yeah, if of God is, is engaged, uh, and this is, in that sense, people would say evolution is simply our way to describe the way God created. Hmm. Um, so, again, we have to be careful to not let the atheists set the agenda. Yeah, yeah. For what we can and cannot do with yeah. an evolutionary model. Yeah, that's great. I love that. Yeah, like I said, it's very refreshing to to, to hear that take on it, um, sort of separate this from, you know, the the origins um, argument, you know, because it's all, you know, it seems like everyone's going to Genesis 1 and using that as the text to prove that the creation is is young or it's old or that, that uh, in, in anyway, um, I'm going to move on to, to Genesis 2 and 3. Um, and my understanding is that you see this as a sequel to one as opposed to a recapitulation. Yes. Um, do you have any, do you have any thoughts as far as how much time had passed between what we're reading about in Genesis one and then with Adam and Eve in Genesis two? No idea whatsoever. Yeah. Uh, how could we tell if the Bible doesn't tell us? Yeah. Yeah. I, thought, um, I see that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So, is there a, any difference between man that we see created in Genesis 1 and Adam? And I ask that because some people talk about Adam as if he's uh, clothed in light. Um, and anyway, I just, I, are we seeing basically the same, the same man? Or is Adam, some people also see Adam as just one of... Uh, the, the men that were created in Genesis 1, where some people see Adam is created de novo, um, or just, you know, in other yeah, words, he, bunch he of didn't stuff. have parents. Yeah. That's a bunch of stuff. Okay, so in Genesis 1, um, the whole idea is to tell us what humanity is, not some hypothetical, theoretical, mystical thing that he maybe at one time was. It's telling us what humanity is. Furthermore, Genesis 1 image of God, which is the main issue there, image bearer equals order bringer, um, that's, that's corporate. It's not individual. Hmm. It's saying humanity is the image of God, not each human is the image of God. Hmm. If you're human, you're part of a group that is the image of God. Just like if you're a Christian, you're part of the group that is the body of Christ. Hmm. I am not the body of Christ. I am part of a group that is the body of Christ. I am not the image of God. I'm part of a group that's the image of God. So it's trying to tell us what humanity is, essentially. Yeah. And that is, we are image bearers, meaning that we are order bringers. 
And by the way, that gets back. I'm not sure I fully answered your question about subduing and ruling. Yeah. Subduing and ruling is the way that it describes bringing order. And that certainly involves the animals, uh, domestication. Uh, it certainly involves uh, plants and things of that sort. It gives people dominion to be order bringers, not to exploit, not to rape the environment, not to do anything we want with it, not to turn everything to our own benefit, but to be order bringers alongside God to bring about his order, not our own. The problem with the fall was that we decided that we wanted to pursue our own order, not his. And so in Genesis 1, it's humanity, population, essence of the being that is addressed. In Genesis mm -hmm. 2, it's going to address something very different because now we have Adam and Eve. They're not, they're not mentioned in Genesis 1. Genesis 1 does not suggest only two. It's a whole population. Yeah. Now, but now uh, Adam and Eve have a very particular role to play, and chapter 2 is going to address that. Gotcha. Now, you um, mentioned de novo. Do you want me to say something yeah, about yeah. that now? Yeah, please. Yeah. Okay. Lots of us get de novo, or lots of people traditionally have, out of Genesis 2-7. Um, and that's problematic. Um, the way that it's read in the translation is that God created hum or formed humanity from the dust of the ground. That's a problematic translation. And I don't talk about this in the Lost World of Adam and Eve. It's developed in some other things that I've done. Uh, but the preposition from is not there. Hmm. The Lord God formed humanity. And actually, there's a break there. Hmm. Uh, what, what's the equivalent of a punctuation mark? The Lord yeah. God formed humanity. Dust of the ground. Hmm. Wow. It's not so much a statement of, a manufacturing process, it's a statement of identity. What are we? Wow. God formed humanity. And forming, by the way, is often not a physical process. It can be, but is more creating something that will have a particular function, bringing about. So wow. um, in Zechariah 12, 2, God formed the spirit within humanity. Hmm. That's not a material step. Yeah. Wow. And so the idea of God formed humanity, that means he gave us an identity. Um, you know, Psalm 103, you, you know our form. You remember that we are dust. Mm -hmm. We're all dust. That's our identity. So Genesis 2, 7 is not talking about a de novo manufacturing process. It's talking about an identity forming statement. Wow. Yeah. And I love that. That changes so much. Um, so you would, you would take the understanding that I guess what I'm hearing, what I'm thinking is that you would more lean towards Adam and Eve having parents and that they were called out much like what we see with, with Abraham. Uh, that's certainly a possibility. Yeah. Uh, the fact that they are dust, we all are dust. Uh, the fact that God gave them an identity, he gives us all our identity. We're yeah. all formed by God. So in that sense, it doesn't make their origin individually any different than ours. Yeah, yeah, awesome. Um, the trees, do you see these as symbolic or do you see them as actual physical trees that, that, that we think of? Maybe. Um, you know, that's one that I think can go either way. Mm -hmm. uh, either way, though, and I, I don't get hung up on that because either way, it's what they stand for that's important. Yeah. Uh, life and wisdom. Yeah. A life tree and a wisdom tree. And both of those have in common that they are something that have their source and center in God. God is a source and center of life, and therefore it is his gift. God is a source and center of wisdom, and therefore it is his gift. Whether there are actually trees or not doesn't make a big difference in the end. Sure, uh, yeah. You know, they could be symbolic. They could be literal. I really have no no horse in that race. 
yeah yeah you're focused on on what yeah and i agree when you focus on what the what the trees are um it kind of in a sense really doesn't it doesn't really doesn't matter so i want to talk about the tree of of wisdom because it was forbidden they were commanded not to eat of it and elsewhere in scripture we see specifically with king solomon wisdom as a good thing mm -hmm. uh, we see the that, that same uh, words of knowledge of, of good and evil um you know being able to discern uh the difference between the two and so why would it be forbidden uh if this is seen as a good thing elsewhere in scripture and is it your understanding that they would eventually come to this knowledge in time? Okay, go back to the idea that order is the highest value. Okay, so everyone desired order. Order is not natural. Non-order is natural. Order has to be made and sustained. How do you do that? The pathway to order is wisdom. There's the connection. Wisdom is a pathway to order. Hmm. Now, if people are supposed to be image bearers and order bringers, working alongside God to bring his order, excuse me, how do they know what his order is? How would they understand his order? It's not something that's innate, yeah. intrinsic to them. It's something that they have to learn. They have to be taught, instructed, mentored, brought along. Yeah. And so the wisdom tree is off limits because that's God's prerogative to bring them along in wisdom, which is not kind of an overnight poof. Now I've got it. Yeah. Yeah. Of okay? But it's a process. And so the tree is off limits in the sense that God is the one who's going to help them understand the pathways to bringing order, his order alongside him as partners, as vice gerents, as, as the stewards. Okay, so in that sense, they're not supposed to jump into this all on their own. When they take from the tree, and this is key, so often we've treated it as the big deal here is disobedience and eating the fruit. I'm not denying that they disobeyed. I'm not denying that they ate the fruit, again, whether symbolic or otherwise. But that's not the main thing. The main thing is by is not what they did, but what they seized. Mm -hmm. What they seized was wisdom to do their own order for their own benefit. They decided they wanted to do it their way, not God's way. That's what's going on in the fall. Not just an act of disobedience that could have just as easily been don't swim in the lake. Sure. Yeah. It's rather seizing wisdom for themselves for the purpose of right. crafting their own pathway to order. Mm. And that order is not God's order. Mm. It's their own. And that's that's been the characteristic of humanity from that day till this. Mm. Pervasive, ubiquitous, our essential nature. We are forging our own order for our own benefits. Wow. So my next question is going to be about original sin um, and how sin entered the world, because that's typically how this is taught, is that by eating of the fruit, sin came in, in, into the world. Um, and, you know, some, you know, we see, I think there's like the Augustine uh, understanding that this is, you know, something that's carry forward um, from generation on, uh, almost like biologically. Um, and then you know, there's the there's another take that, that see this sees this as uh, law being introduced. And so now they're accountable. Um, what's your take on on how sin entered into the world? You know, Augustine had a lot of great ideas that have proved fundamental for how Christians think but he's not Paul. And there are plenty of things when you read Augustine that he is just wrong about. Mm -hmm. Augustine does not have authority. We respect him. We learn from him. Um, but his viewpoints are not authoritative, even if they have become traditional. 
So we have to be careful. Um, of course, uh, besides Augustine, you've got the viewpoints of Irenaeus, who saw things very differently and presented a different view of sin and how it works. They're great theologians, and we need to learn from them. But we have to be uh, critical in the best ways about what they have to say. And for me, that always means I want to drive back to the text, whether it's the text in Genesis or the text in Paul, and those two won't necessarily be addressing things the same way, and that's okay. Mm -hmm. They both have authority. Um, certainly, Paul has his own take on sin, uh, although Augustine goes far beyond what Paul does Yeah. when he talks about sin nature or original sin. Augustine's view is quite different from Paul's. And so we've got what Paul says. But of course, when I'm dealing with Genesis, I want to deal with Genesis. Um, and so uh, I, I look in vain in Genesis to find them talking about sin or its origin or its nature. Yeah. The word sin kind of pops up in Genesis 4. Sin is crouching at your door. Yeah. Uh, but it really is not a main theme. And it's interesting that in the entire Old Testament, it never looks back to this event in the Garden of Eden. It mentions Adam in the genealogy of Chronicles. It refers to trees of life in Proverbs. It refers to the importance of wisdom, though it doesn't connect it to the tree or the garden. It refers to the Garden of Eden in places like Ezekiel 28, but it doesn't really talk about this incident. It never comes back to the serpent. Yeah. Um, so, for the Israelites in the Old Testament, they were not tracking this big theme of sin and sin nature and original sin, going back to the garden and the fruit and the, and the snake. Yeah. It just wasn't that significant to them. So if you're thinking in an Old Testament context, I think that aspect has to be recognized as being not as big a deal as it becomes in Christian theology. And that's not to somehow demean Christian theology, but is text important or isn't it? It, it yeah. is. Mm -hmm. I'll answer that. And so we really want to try to understand what Genesis is doing before we get to Paul and find out what Paul does with Genesis. Because Paul's not so much talking about what Genesis is doing but he's doing something with Genesis, and that's fine. He's inspired, and he's got the authority to do that. But that's still something that's that's a different level. And then, of course, we find out what Augustine does with Paul. Now, these are all sure. steps in the process. Sure, yeah. Um, okay, I got you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I know. This stuff's so hard to wrap yeah. your brain around, isn't it? It, it really is. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm trying to think, I don't want to follow up on that because I want to make time for um, also same event um, by eating the fruit. Um, you know, their eyes are open. Before that, uh, there was no shame in their nakedness. Uh, elsewhere in Scripture, we see nakedness as something that there should be shame for, but there is no shame. Um, so it seems like there's a, like a childlike innocence here. Um, and so following through with eating the fruit and their eyes being opened, it seems as if something, you know, something happened um, that as a result, they realized their nakedness. Um, so was something, did something biological happen there? Um, and do you follow um, or would you adhere to this idea that they were, they had a, like a childlike innocence prior to the <clears throat> uh, to, to eating the fruit. Childlike innocence would be one way to describe it, but I go back to my word order. In the ancient world, nakedness was considered characteristic of those who were primitive, had not yet come to understand order, which in Mesopotamia particularly was was found in civilization civilized people wear clothes yeah yeah civilized people 
have a sophistication and an understanding of what constitutes order. And so nakedness is used to describe those who are uncivilized, primitive, not yet having achieved the order of civilized life. It's possible that in the Bible, it's no different in this, on this count. That is, that their nakedness and being unaware of it suggests they have not yet gained the wisdom that would lead to order and a more sophisticated understanding. When they took wisdom for themselves, one of the results was their eyes were opened to a more civilized way of thinking. And they said, whoa, we don't have clothes on. <laughs> and that's not mm -hmm. a good thing. Yeah. Um, so those are the terms that I think, instead of, again, I think it's Augustinian terms that they were clothed in light. Yeah. You know, yeah, yeah. Um, I tend to think in the ancient world terms uh, that nakedness is connected to non-order. Hmm. Okay, yeah. So you actually uh, anticipated my question about, about being clothed with light. Um, that was kind of in the background, but I didn't ask. Um, that was cool. Uh, the serpent. Uh, do you see the serpent as coming from outside of the garden, or do you see the serpent as being native to the garden? Um, we're, it's not even clear in the text that the serpent is encountered in the garden. In the garden? Hmm. Yeah, you're right. Um, you know, we the the typical art has them entwined in in the forbidden tree. Yeah, uh, that's that's artist's imagination. Um, sure. Uh, if if the temple, I'm sorry, if the garden is comparable to a temple, and if Adam and Eve are in the role of priests, which is something that I have presented, then are they in the garden all the time? Yeah. Uh, or maybe they are. I, I can't say yes. I can't say no. Yeah. But it um, it sort of pushes us past the question of what is the serpent doing in the garden? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. We, we don't know that he's in the garden. Yeah. It maybe is. We don't know. Yeah. So uh, they encounter the serpent, um, and. Again, from an Old Testament perspective, there's no reason to think of the serpent as Satan. They certainly never came to that conclusion in the Old Testament. And so if we're going to understand Genesis in the context of Genesis, we have to think in different terms. Yeah. So I have a question about that, actually, because I, I heard you state that. Um, but we do see the illusion in the New Testament. So do you interpret that as uh, them giving the serpent uh, satanic attributes, or do you see this as this is uh, the serpent is Satan? Revelation is portraying the ultimate chaos creature, mm -hmm. and it uses the image of a dragon, seven heads. It uses the imagery of Satan, who is the ultimate chaos creature, mm -hmm. and it uses the image of the serpent. Uh, who I believe is a chaos creature. Um, so Revelation is drawing all of that imagery together uh, to present its portrayal. That's not the same thing as saying uh, Satan is a seven-headed Leviathan or Satan is the serpent in the garden. Yeah, It's a combining of images. You'll notice, yeah. for instance, in the same way, uh, the, the beast of Revelation combines the four beasts of Daniel 7. Right, yeah. And so, again, Re mm. John in Revelation uses all this imagery, but combines it and interweaves it into various different things. In that way, I'm not convinced that Revelation is actually identifying the serpent as having been Satan. Yeah. It's rather grouping them all together in this ultimate chaos portrayal yeah i gotcha so this might be a silly question but we always see the serpent depicted as a garden snake looking at as a chaos creature um 
what do you have in your mind as how this chaos creature would have actually physically appeared uh, to look like before Adam and Eve? Well, again, even John calls it dracon, dragon. Mm -hmm. And uh, even up into medieval literature, sometimes it's portrayed in dragon type shapes. It's interesting also uh, when they portray the temptation scene in medieval art, the serpent often has the face of the woman. I've seen that. Although yeah. sometimes it does have the face of the man. Mm -hmm. um, even in Michelangelo's Sistine Chapel, you know, we, we see those kinds of things. So, uh, you know, the, the idea of treating this as a simple serpent, um, the, what supports that is the idea that God says the serpent is one of the creatures of the field that God created. Exactly, yeah. But the fact is, there are other creatures that God has created that are viewed as chaos creatures. Chaos creatures aren't necessarily right. just um, non-zoological. Yeah. A, uh, coyote, a hyena... Uh, a screech owl, uh, they would all be considered chaos creatures, uh, as well as Leviathan and Behemoth and all of those mm -hmm. things. Gotcha. Um, wow. So I think before we, we close out, I will say um, one thing in, in studying Genesis, uh, as I have in, in the past few months, uh, and that I love about as far as what you bring out here is I see so many parallels between uh, the garden story in Adam and Eve um, and with, with Israel. And so it really, uh, it makes this story uh, more relevant to, to the, the rest of Scripture as opposed to just being some sort of, it, it's we, it's almost like it's in this, a whole separate box if you look at it um, almost in the traditional sense. There's kind of a, a disconnect, and it, it kind of comes across uh, as um, almost fantasy. Um, but I think uh, reading it in this light, it's it's a uh, it's just been it's been a, a real blessing to me. So I want to thank you for that. Um, yeah, and there's probably more I, I could ask. Um, um, I think I think we covered uh, most of what I wanted to, uh, to talk about. Um, yes, yeah, so I'll invite you to say anything else, and I think we can close up. Okay. So uh, Lost World of Genesis 1 was first published in 2009, and lots of the ideas I had come to sort of in the decade leading up to that. Um, since 2009, of course, I've been speaking about this often, lots of places, hundreds of podcasts and speaking around the world. And the advantage of that is that I've developed ways to say things better, yeah. to say things more clearly, to use illustrations like House and Home, for instance, yeah. um, and to, to figure out how to communicate more clearly. Now, as a result... Um, this summer, I'm going to begin working on a book called Advances in the Lost World of Genesis. Hmm. And I will hmm. bring the whole conversation up to date. I'll interact with some of the most frequently asked questions, which podcast hosts ask, but also which critics ask, yeah. uh, and deal with those questions and try to uh, use illustrations that I've found helpful for audiences. And so, um, so things things are moving to the next level, so to speak, Yeah. Um, as I continue to try to communicate these ideas, which I think are very important ideas for our um, understanding of scripture and for our interaction with the world today, both uh, in terms of theology and in terms of culture. Yeah, I think that's so cool. Uh, that's really awesome to hear that because, um, like I said, I mean, I, I could probably go back and read this again, but, you know, like I said, I, I'm just reading a lot about Genesis in general, and so many people are expanding on, on these ideas, but it, it's, it's a, it is difficult, and it is challenging, and I think that's part of the learning process. I think that's actually a, a really good thing, um, but with that, it's, it, it's not just, at least my experience, I, I wasn't able to just, you know, I think the first time I kind of heard some of this understanding was, was in a different book that was sort of referencing your work. I think I, I listened to some of your talks at uh, Lost World Conference and I picked up the books. I'm reading more and more. Um, so it's not just reading one one book or hearing one podcast and it just sort of clicks. I found that um, 
I've had to really sort of wrestle um, with with reorienting how I'm thinking about reading uh, these chapters in the Bible. So um, the fact that you're putting in that work and recognizing um, that experience that, that readers are having, uh, I think is really neat. Um, awesome. So like, uh, like I said before, uh, it's always a pleasure having you on. Uh, enjoy this conversation. Um, always, always challenging, um, always very helpful. So, uh, so thanks for coming on. Um, and uh, yeah, if you would uh, close this out in prayer. Sure. Lord, thanks for this opportunity to, to talk, to try to bring clarity to your word, to uh, bring out new ideas, put new information on the table to help uh, people who are really serious about your word uh, work through these things and uh, try to understand more clearly what it is that uh, you want us to, to do and the kind of people you want us to be. Thanks for Samuel and his ministry, and I pray that you'll bring blessing on that. And uh, for all those listening, we pray that uh, you will help them to, to think well about Scripture. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. There you have it, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for listening. Make sure to like and subscribe. If you enjoyed this episode, make sure to share it with somebody you know. And with that being said, we'll catch you on the next one.